What did Jesus mean when he instructed us to turn the other cheek? What did Jesus mean by turn the other cheek? Many people think this lesson teaches us to be passive and submissive when others are aggressive, wrongly suggesting we should accept mistreatment. This idea gets the lesson wrong. It's not about letting ourselves be victims, but about promoting peace and self-control. At the end of this video, you will have a better understanding of what Jesus meant. Before the Sermon on the Mount To set the stage, it's essential to understand what was happening before Jesus delivered this groundbreaking sermon. Jesus, having begun his ministry in Galilee, was gaining attention for his teachings and miracles. People from various places were drawn to him, curious, and often desperate for healing and wisdom. Now picture this. Jesus, seeing the multitudes, goes up on a mountain. His disciples gather around him, and he begins to teach them. This moment marks the beginning of what we now call the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. It's a radical teaching, covering a range of topics, from blessings, the Beatitudes, to prayer and fasting. The Heart of the Law Why does Jesus start talking about the law, specifically an eye for an eye? Let's think about this for a moment. In those times, the Jewish law, as given through Moses, was central to the people's lives. An eye for an eye Exodus chapter 21 verse 24, Leviticus chapter 24 verse 20, was actually a legal principle known as lex talionis. It was meant to provide fair justice, ensuring the punishment matched the crime, no more and no less. But here's the twist. Jesus takes this well-known principle and turns it upside down. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Matthew chapter 5 verses 38 through 39. What's happening here? Jesus isn't discarding the law. He's deepening it, moving from mere legalism to the heart's attitudes. He challenges his listeners, and us, to think. Is it enough to just avoid doing harm? Or are we called to actively seek peace and forgiveness? The Right Cheek Now, imagine someone slapping you on the right cheek. In a right-handed world, this would likely be a backhand slap, considered highly insulting. Jesus is not telling us to be passive in the face of abuse. Rather, he's teaching a radical form of nonviolent resistance. By turning the other cheek, the person struck is saying, I refuse to retaliate, but I also refuse to be humiliated. It's a powerful act of dignity and strength, not weakness. Should we take this instruction literally? It's not always about not fighting back. It's more about a rule. When faced with hostility, don't seek revenge. Instead, stand your ground in a peaceful way that shows the unfairness and aims to do what's morally right. The Larger Message This teaching fits into the larger message of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is calling his followers to a higher standard, not just following rules but transforming hearts. He talks about loving your enemies, giving to the needy, and praying for those who persecute you. Matthew chapter 5 verse 44. It's a radical departure from the tit-for-tat mentality. Jesus in his sermon wasn't just giving a legal instruction. He was painting a picture of the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom where love and mercy override the natural instincts for revenge and retaliation. To respond to hate with love, to injury with forgiveness. 
But isn't this the radical, transformative way of life that Jesus was all about? Hold on for a moment. There is more to this teaching than you can imagine. Is Jesus telling us to be doormats? At first glance, it might seem like Jesus is asking his followers to be passive or even weak. But is that really the case? Let's think about it. Jesus in his teachings consistently advocated for dignity, respect, and love. The key here is not about being a doormat. It's about a profound strength that comes from choosing not to retaliate with violence or revenge. It's a call to a higher form of strength, a strength that lies in restraint and love rather than in aggression and revenge. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, a principle of strict justice. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person who insults you or violates your rights. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other toward him also. Simply ignore insignificant insults or trivial losses and do not bother to retaliate. Maintain your dignity your self-respect, your poise. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 39. It goes against our natural instincts, but Jesus is calling for a non-violent response to aggression, not for the sake of passivity, but as a way of breaking the cycle of retaliation and violence. It's about maintaining dignity in the face of insult, not about allowing oneself to be abused or harmed purpose of the Law of Moses. The Law of Moses as given in Exodus chapter 21 verses 23 to 25 was clear. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Isn't it fascinating how Jesus takes these principles and redirects them towards peace and reconciliation, rather than retribution? Jesus' Purpose in the Teaching What's Jesus really getting at with this teaching? He's showing us a new way to relate to each other, especially in situations of conflict or offense. It's not about getting even or responding in kind. Jesus is essentially saying, don't strike back. Don't spend your life trying to get even. This echoes in Romans chapter 12, verses 18 through 19, where Paul writes, If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It's about showing Christ's love in the face of hostility. It's about being a reflection of Jesus' love and grace, even when it's difficult. When Jesus asks us to turn the other cheek, he's calling for a radical form of strength and dignity that comes from choosing love and peace over retaliation. It's about breaking the cycle of violence and showing the world a different, more compassionate way of living. This teaching challenges us to rethink our natural responses to hurt and injustice, urging us to act in ways that reflect God's love and mercy. It's a tough call, but isn't it a powerful way to live out our faith in a world that often values payback or revenge rather than reconciliation? Jesus Four Commands to Illustrate This Principle Understanding Jesus' instruction to turn the other cheek as found in Matthew chapter 5 verses 38 through 42 requires delving deeper than the surface interpretation, contrary to common misconceptions. Never return insult for insult. Imagine someone insults you deeply. What do you do? Jesus says, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. 
This verse is about choosing not to escalate the situation. In Jesus' time, being struck on the right cheek was considered an insult. Remember, not retaliating doesn't mean you approve or accept the behavior. It's about maintaining your dignity and not sinking to the level of your offender. Be willing to give up your possessions or rights for peace. Jesus said, And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Matthew chapter 5 verse 40 This doesn't mean we should let others unfairly take advantage of us. It's about the attitude of our hearts, isn't it? Are we so attached to our possessions or rights that we lose sight of peace and love? It's about showing that relationships and people are more important than material things. It's a radical call to generosity and humility. Do more than you're required to do for others. Here's a challenging one. And whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Matthew chapter 5 verse 41. This refers to a Roman practice where soldiers could compel civilians to carry their equipment for a mile. Jesus is saying, go beyond what is demanded of you. It's a lesson in serving others, even those we might not like or agree with. It's about surprising others with kindness and showing a different way to live. Can you imagine the impact of such actions in a world that expects the minimum? Give generously to those who ask. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Matthew chapter 5 verse 42 Jesus isn't saying you should give away everything you own or lend money to everyone who asks. It's about having a generous spirit, especially towards those in need. It's discerning when your giving can truly help someone rather than enabling harmful behavior. Generosity isn't just about money. It's about being generous with your time, attention, and care as well. Balancing the Message Remember, Jesus also taught self-defense and taking a stand at appropriate times. He told his disciples, But now, he who has a money belt is to take it along, and also his provision bag, and he who has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. Luke chapter 22 verse 36 Yet also instructed Peter to put the sword back in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? John chapter 18 verse 11 This isn't a contradiction, but a balance. There's a time to stand up and fight and there's a time to turn the other cheek. Wisdom lies in knowing the difference. Applying the Principle Today How do we apply these teachings in our lives today? It's about choosing a response that reflects the values of love, peace, and dignity. It's about breaking cycles of retaliation and showing a different, more compassionate way of living. It's about understanding that our responses can either escalate or de-escalate a situation. Jesus' message in the Sermon on the Mount challenges us to think and act differently. It's about not allowing ourselves to be governed by instinctive reactions of revenge or anger. This approach requires strength, courage, and a deep commitment to the values Jesus taught. It's a radical way to live but isn't that the essence of what Jesus was all about? The Context of Matthew Chapter 5 Imagine you're in ancient Galilee, in the midst of a world bustling with Roman occupation, religious scholars debating in the streets, and ordinary people striving for survival and meaning. Into this world steps Jesus, a carpenter-turned-teacher, whose words and actions are stirring up all sorts of talk. People are curious, skeptical, and in some cases desperate for hope. Now picture this. Jesus, seeing a large crowd gathering, 
decides it's time for a teachable moment. He climbs a mountain, not for solitude this time, but as a stage for one of the most revolutionary teachings in human history. His disciples and a diverse crowd, including skeptics and seekers, gather around. This is the setting for what we now call the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus begins with the Beatitudes. Blessed, spiritually prosperous, happy to be admired are the poor in spirit, those devoid of spiritual arrogance, those who regard themselves as insignificant. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, both now and forever. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. In a world where power and wealth often define success, here is Jesus turning everything upside down. He's saying that in God's kingdom, it's not about wealth or power, but about humility and recognizing our need for God. Our Influence in the World Jesus continues with a series of teachings that challenges the very core of how people understand righteousness and religious practice. He talks about being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 14 Encouraging his listeners to influence the world positively. But how? That's the big question. Other Teachings of Jesus Jesus then dives into some hard-hitting topics. Anger, lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and love for enemies. He says things like, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who so much as looks at a woman with lust for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Matthew chapter 5 verses 27 through 28 It's not just about actions, it's about the heart. Why do you think Jesus emphasizes the heart so much? Jesus' teachings in Matthew chapter 5 verses 27 through 28, which emphasize the importance of the heart to moral and ethical behavior, reflect a significant shift from the traditional interpretation of the law in the Old Testament. The Old Testament commandment against adultery, Exodus chapter 20 verse 14, Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 18, is traditionally understood in the context of property rights and theft, particularly in relation to stealing another man's wife. This way of understanding the rule matched what most people and laws thought back then. During that time, women were often seen as things that belonged to their husbands, like a property. By stating that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart, Matthew chapter 5 verses 27 through 28, Jesus is highlighting a few key principles. Number 1. Internal Motives Matter Jesus' teaching emphasizes that morality and sin are not just about external actions, but also about internal thoughts and intentions. This is a radical shift from a purely legalistic interpretation of the law, where adherence to the law's letter was the primary focus. Number 2. Purity of Heart Jesus is advocating for purity of heart, which goes beyond physical actions. He is suggesting that true righteousness involves controlling not just one's actions, but also one's thoughts and desires. Number 3. Respect and Dignity for Others By addressing lust, Jesus is implicitly upholding the dignity and worth of individuals, particularly women, beyond their status in society as property or objects of desire. This perspective fosters respect and equality, viewing others as fellow beings worthy of dignity, rather than as objects for personal gratification. Number 4. Radical Ethical Standard Jesus asks his followers to aim for a better way of behaving that's more than just following rules. He wants them to think about why they do things, which pushes people to try harder to be truly good in a fuller way. 
Number 5. Personal Accountability This teaching places the responsibility for sin on the individual's own desires and thoughts, rather than external circumstances or provocations. It calls for personal accountability in managing one's own heart and mind. However, Jesus changed the way we understand this rule, to focus on what people feel and think inside, not just what they do on the outside. The teachings of the Sermon on the Mount continue through Matthew chapter 6 and 7. Jesus touches on giving to the needy, prayer, including the Lord's Prayer, fasting, handling material wealth, and not worrying about life's needs. It's a call to trust God deeply and live differently from the world's ways. He cautions about not being quick to judge others, talks about the importance of continuously asking in prayer, and explains how to tell real followers from fake ones. The talk ends with a well-known story comparing smart builders to foolish ones. Jesus says, So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man, a far-sighted practical and sensible man, who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods and torrents came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish, stupid man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods and torrents came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And it fell, and great and complete was its fall. Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 Isn't that a powerful image of what it means to live out his teachings? When Jesus finishes, the crowd is amazed. They've never heard anyone teach like this. He wasn't just another rabbi. He spoke with authority, directly challenging the established norms and inviting people into a new way of life, a life that changes on the inside, not just doing what everyone else does on the outside. So what does all this mean for us today? Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount continue to challenge and inspire. They call us to examine our hearts, our motives, and our actions. They invite us into a life of deeper righteousness, rooted in love, mercy, and justice. It's not just about following rules. It's about a transformation that starts from within and radiates outward. In essence, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' manifesto for life in God's kingdom. It's radical, countercultural, and deeply challenging. But it's also a vision of life as God intended, a life marked by peace, justice, and a love that changes the world. What is the historical background of Matthew chapter 5? Understanding the historical context of Matthew chapter 5 especially the teaching about turning the other cheek, requires diving into the world of first-century Judea, a land under Roman occupation. This setting is crucial for grasping the depth and radical nature of Jesus' teachings. Picture this. Israel, at the time Jesus spoke these words, was not a free country. It was under the heavy hand of the Roman Empire, the Romans were known for their strict control and often harsh treatment of the territories they conquered. For the Jewish people, this meant living daily with the reality of being second-class citizens in their own homeland. To understand this, we need to consider how Romans treated their subjects. Paul T. Penley, in his insightful analysis, points out a subtle yet significant detail about Roman soldiers and how they struck people. Roman soldiers, typically right-handed, used a backhand slap to strike their Jewish subjects. This was not just a physical assault, it was a calculated insult, a way to enforce their superiority and the Jews' inferior status. 
This backhand slap, as Corey Farr explains, wasn't just a slap. It was a symbol of oppression and humiliation. It was what you'd do to someone you considered inferior, like a slave. So when Jesus says to turn the other cheek, what's really going on? Imagine the scene. A Roman soldier backhands a Jewish person, striking the right cheek. If the person turns the left cheek, what happens next? The soldier can't use his left hand. That's culturally inappropriate, even unclean. His only option was to use an open hand slap, which was how equals were treated. So, in a sense, by turning the other cheek, the oppressed person silently asserts, I am your equal. I refuse to be humiliated. This act of turning the other cheek is a subtle, yet powerful statement of dignity and resistance. It's saying, you can hit me, but you can't take away my humanity. Isn't that an incredibly courageous way to stand up to injustice? This idea of accepting suffering with dignity wasn't new to the Jewish people. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 30, written during the Babylonian captivity, we find a similar sentiment. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him. Let him be filled with disgrace. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 30. Here, the prophet Jeremiah talks about enduring suffering and humiliation with a sense of hope and trust in God's ultimate justice. So, when Jesus tells his listeners to turn the other cheek, he is tapping into a deep cultural and religious vein. He's not promoting victimhood. Rather, he's teaching a radical form of nonviolent resistance. He's showing a way to confront injustice, not with hatred or vengeance, but with dignity and a sense of identity and worth. This teaching, as challenging as it is, poses a question to all of us. How do we respond to injustice and oppression? Do we retaliate with the same currency of violence and hatred? Or do we find a way to assert our dignity and humanity, standing up for what's right in a way that honors God's higher call? Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5 invite us to think deeply and to pick a way that might seem strange or opposite at first, but it brings real power and change. Bible Characters That Illustrate Turning the Other Cheek When we talk about turning the other cheek, we often think of it as a weak response to aggression. But let's dive into the Bible, and you'll see it's nothing like that. It's actually a unique display of strength, courage, and trust in God. Let's look at some biblical characters who beautifully illustrate this principle. Number 1. Jesus Christ, the perfect model. Jesus himself is the epitome of this teaching. Think about it. The Son of God, who had all the power in the universe at his disposal, chose not to use it for personal defense. In the face of mockery, abuse, and ultimate crucifixion, he responded not with retaliation, but with a silent, dignified strength. During his trial and crucifixion, he was insulted, beaten, and mocked. Yet, as told in John chapter 18 verses 19 through 24, and John chapter 19 verse 3, he either spoke truth or remained silent. Isaiah had prophesied about him, saying, I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not hide my face from humiliation and spitting. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 6 And again, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth to complain or defend himself. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before her shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7 in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20-23, twenty through 23, we're reminded of how Jesus, After all, 
what kind of credit is there if when you do wrong and are punished for it, you endure it patiently? But if when you do what is right and patiently bear undeserved suffering, this finds favor with God. Number 2. Joseph From Betrayal to Forgiveness Now let's travel back to the Old Testament and look at Joseph. His story in Genesis chapters 37 through 50 is like a roller coaster. Betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, falsely accused and imprisoned. If anyone had a reason to seek revenge, it was Joseph. But what does he do when he finally encounters his brothers again? Now as the second most powerful man in Egypt, he forgives them. Joseph says to his brothers, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present outcome, that many people would be kept alive as they are this day. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 He sees the bigger picture of God's plan and chooses forgiveness over bitterness. Isn't that a powerful testament to the strength of character? Number 3. David, a warrior's restraint David, the shepherd boy who became a king. David, a man of war and a mighty warrior, had a lot of opportunities to kill King Saul who was unjustly pursuing him. But David chose restraint. In one incident, David sneaks into Saul's camp and gets close enough to kill him, but chooses only to take a piece of his robe. Later, feeling remorseful for even this act of aggression, David says to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, since he is the anointed of the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 26 verse 11 Even though Saul was unjust and cruel, David refrained from taking matters into his own hands. He left vengeance to the Lord. This act showed a lot about how David understood and respected God's sovereignty. So, what do these stories tell us about turning the other cheek? It's about demonstrating a different kind of strength. It's the strength to control one's own reactions, to trust in God's justice, and to respond to evil with good. It's about understanding that our actions should reflect our faith and values, even or especially when it's hardest to do so. Turning the other cheek, as Jesus and these biblical characters show us, is a courageous, active stance against injustice. It's choosing to respond in a way that aligns with God's character, with grace, mercy, and trust in His ultimate plan. Isn't that an incredibly challenging, yet rewarding way to live? Balancing a Personal Response and Governmental Authority like in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 11, where Solomon talks about rescuing those being led to death, does that imply physical intervention? Or Exodus chapter 22, verse 2, which says it's okay to defend your home, even if it means the thief gets killed. These verses suggest there's a time for defensive action. But remember, they're talking about protection and justice, not vengeance or aggression. Here's where it gets interesting. The Bible makes a distinction between personal ethics and governmental responsibilities. Romans chapter 13 verses 1 through 4 tells us that governing authorities are established by God to maintain order and justice. They have the right to use force if necessary to restrain and punish evil. So, while as individuals we're called to turn the other cheek, the government has a different role in dealing with wrongdoing. So, is turning the other cheek the same as pacifism? One thing you should know is that it's not a blanket rule for all situations, but a guideline for personal conduct that emphasizes love, humility, and trust in God's justice. In a world that often glorifies retaliation, 
Turning the other cheek is a radical call to live out a higher standard of love and peace. Isn't that a challenging, yet a unique way to navigate life's complexities? How should we respond when we are wrong? When we are wrong, it's like being at a crossroads with multiple sides pointing in different directions. It's easy to follow the path of retaliation or bitterness. But what does the Bible suggest as the better route? Number 1. Embrace humility like Jesus Jesus is our ultimate example here. He was the Son of God, yet He chose to take on the role of a servant. Despite being mocked, betrayed, and ultimately crucified, He remained humble and submitted to God's will. Imagine that, the Creator of the universe, choosing not to assert His power, but instead showing humility. It's beautifully summarized in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7-8, through 8, where it says Jesus, but emptied Himself without renouncing or diminishing His deity, but only temporarily giving up the outward expression of divine equality and His rightful dignity. By assuming the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. He became completely human, but was without sin, being fully God and fully man. After he was found in terms of his outward appearance as a man, for a divinely appointed time, he humbled himself still further by becoming obedient to the Father to the point of death, even death on a cross. Number 2. Choose wisdom and purity in response. When wrong, we often react immediately, don't we? But Jesus taught us, Listen carefully. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Have no self-serving agenda. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. This means... When faced with insults or rudeness, we shouldn't retaliate, but respond with wisdom and maintain purity in our motives. Sometimes, it's better to remain silent than to lash out. As Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 says, A soft and gentle and thoughtful answer turns away wrath, but harsh and painful and careless words stir up anger. Number 3. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Matthew chapter 5 verse 39 advises us not to resist an evil person. This doesn't mean we become passive or apathetic towards evil. Instead, it's about keeping our focus on Jesus and seeking God's perspective in the situation. Remember Romans chapter 12 verses 17 through 19. Never repay anyone evil for evil. Take thought for what is right and gracious and proper in the sight of everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath and His judicial righteousness. For it is written in Scripture, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Number 4. Be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Jesus calls us to be peacemakers, not instigators or agitators. This means not acting sinfully on our emotions or making a mountain out of a molehill. Seeking peace doesn't mean ignoring wrongs. It's about addressing them in a way that aims for reconciliation and harmony. Number 5. Love, Pray, and bless your enemies. It seems like it doesn't make sense, doesn't it? But Jesus said, But I say to you, love, that is unselfishly seek the best or higher good for your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew chapter 5 verse 44. This kind of selfless love reflects the grace of God. It's about showing kindness to those who may not deserve it and praying for them, which in turn changes our own hearts and attitudes. 
Blessing those who hurt us is a powerful way to demonstrate Christ's love in action. Number six, stand against wickedness with wisdom and discernment. This is important. Turning the other cheek doesn't mean allowing continuous abuse or harm. It's not about being a doormat. In situations of serious abuse or danger, it's important to seek wise counsel and take appropriate action. This might mean setting boundaries, removing oneself from harm's way, or dealing with the situation from a position of strength and dignity in Christ. It's about responding in a way that upholds your worth and dignity, while still striving to reflect Christ's love and forgiveness. So, how should we respond when we're wrong? It's about balancing humility, wisdom, and love with the courage to stand against injustice in a Christ-like way. It's not easy, and it often goes against our natural human feelings. But by doing so, we align ourselves with God's heart, reflecting His grace and mercy in a world that desperately needs it. Remember, it's not just about how we act, but why, and with what attitude we do so. That's what makes all the difference, don't you think? Common Misinterpretations In the world of Christian teachings, there's a verse that often gets misinterpreted, leading to some confusion about how we should respond when wronged. For example, Christians should not retaliate at all. Some people think that if you're a Christian and someone wrongs you, you should just take it and not do anything. But is that really what Jesus meant? Let's look a little closer. He wasn't suggesting that we should let people harm us or that we should stay in dangerous situations. So what's the real message? It's about not responding with revenge or aggression. Jesus is guiding us away from the cycle of retaliation. Christians shouldn't react when they or others are hurt. Some think that if you're a Christian, you shouldn't react at all when you see injustice or when someone is being hurt. But let's think about that. Does it really make sense? Actually, we are called to respond, but in a way that aligns with Christ's teachings. This response isn't about getting back at someone or being passive bystanders. Instead, it's about engaging actively but not through revenge or violence. We're called to be part of the solution, standing up for what's right and sharing God's love and truth. We are tasked with spreading the gospel, and sometimes this means standing up against wrongs and injustices, but always with love and not with the intent of revenge. Consider Proverbs chapter 20, verse 22. Do not say, I will repay evil. Wait expectantly for the Lord, and He will rescue and save you. This verse teaches us to leave revenge to God and not take it into our own hands. How should Christians respond then? The key is to respond in a way that upholds justice and compassion without stooping to retaliation or hatred. We can stand against wrongdoing and protect ourselves and others, but always through the lens of Christ-like love and forgiveness. When wronged, our first instinct might be to hit back, to get even. But Jesus calls us to a higher way, doesn't he? It's not easy, and it certainly goes against our natural inclinations, but it's a path that leads to peace, healing, and ultimately, a reflection of the kingdom of God in this world. Is there ever a time to retaliate? When we think about retaliation, our minds often jump to images of payback or getting even. But in the Christian context, retaliation takes on a very different meaning. It's not about returning harm for harm, but rather responding in a way that aligns with Christian values and teachings. Let's dive into this a bit more. The Biblical Stories of Joseph and David Going back to the story of Joseph in Genesis, his brothers, driven by jealousy, sell him into slavery. 
It's a betrayal of the worst kind. Yet years later, when famine strikes and his brothers come to Egypt seeking help, Joseph's response in Genesis chapter 50 verse 21 is heartwarming. He says, So then, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. He reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph had every reason to retaliate in the conventional sense, but he chose forgiveness and kindness. Why? Because his actions were driven by a deeper understanding of God's plans and purposes. Now let's also revisit David's story. As mentioned earlier, he was relentlessly pursued by King Saul, who wanted him dead. Remember, David had opportunities to kill Saul but chose not to. Instead, David's form of retaliation was not to harm Saul, but to respect God's timing and plan for his life. This is seen in 1st and 2nd Samuel. David's restraint and respect for Saul, despite Saul's intentions, shows a different kind of strength and retaliation, one that respects God's anointed and trusts in God's justice. Retaliation in a Christian Context so what does Christian retaliation look like? It's about responding, not reacting. It's about standing up for what's right, but doing so in a way that reflects Christ's teachings. It's not about seeking personal revenge, but about protecting oneself and others. And sometimes, it involves forgiveness and mercy where it's least expected. Imagine someone wrongs you. What if you chose to respond in a way that seeks to correct the wrong, not with hatred, but with the intention of restoration and healing? What if retaliation meant standing up for justice, but doing so with love and respect? Retaliation versus Revenge There's a fine line between retaliation and revenge. Christian revenge is not about getting back at someone for personal reasons or harboring evil. It's about responding in a way that upholds justice and truth, without losing sight of love and forgiveness. Referring back to Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 19, this passage encourages us to seek peace and leave vengeance to God. Retaliation in the Christian sense is about responding to wrongdoing in a way that reflects God's character. It's about seeking justice but also about offering forgiveness and showing mercy. It's about standing up for oneself and others in a way that honors God, rather than satisfying our own desires for revenge. It's about asking, what would Jesus do in this situation, and then striving to do likewise? Imagine how the world would look if we all retaliated in this way. Our Response to Offense the idea that revenge is of God is a powerful and challenging concept, especially in a world where the urge to retaliate when wronged feels so natural. Understanding the Human Desire for Revenge First off, let's be real. When someone wrongs us, our first instinct is often to want to get back at them, right? It's almost like a reflex. This isn't just about physical confrontation. It's about our reactions to being wronged in general. Jesus is essentially asking us to do something that goes against our natural inclinations. Vengeance belongs to God. Now here's where it gets interesting. The Bible tells us that vengeance is God's domain. In Romans chapter 12 verse 19 it's written, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath and his judicial righteousness. For it is written in Scripture, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. This doesn't mean that God is vengeful in a petty human way. Instead, it's about God being the ultimate judge, who sees the full picture and can administer justice perfectly. This is a tough pill to swallow, but think about it. If we all took revenge into our own hands, wouldn't the world be an endless cycle of retaliation? 
correcting and rebuking with love. So, what are we supposed to do when faced with evil or wrongdoing? The Bible guides us to correct and rebuke evil, but it emphasizes doing so with God's Word and in a spirit of love. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it instructs, Preach the Word as an official messenger. Be ready when the time is right, and even when it is not. Keep your sense of urgency, whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, whether convenient or inconvenient, whether welcome or unwelcome. Correct those who err in doctrine or behavior. Warn those who sin. Exhort and encourage those who are growing towards spiritual maturity with an exhaustible patience and faithful teaching. It's about engaging with the world in a way that reflects God's character. Conclusion Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38-39 through 39, can be summarized into three key principles. Number one, the principle of non-retaliation. Turning the other cheek is a radical departure from the old eye-for-an-eye eye mentality. Jesus isn't saying we should let people walk all over us. Instead, he's advocating for a different kind of response, one that doesn't escalate violence or seek revenge. Think about it. Doesn't retaliating often just make things worse? Number 2. The Power of Forgiveness Forgiveness can be tough, right? but it's powerful. Jesus teaches us that forgiveness isn't just a one-time act, but a continual attitude. Remember when Peter asked Jesus how often he should forgive someone? Jesus replied, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Matthew chapter 18 verse 22. That's a lot of forgiveness. It doesn't mean we should keep track or count everything. It means our forgiveness should be limitless. Forgiving someone doesn't mean what they did was okay. Rather, it's about letting go of the hold that resentment and anger have on us. It's freeing, isn't it? Number 3. Love for Enemies This one's probably the toughest. Love your enemies. Really? Jesus says, but I say to you who hear me and pay attention to my words. Love, that is, unselfishly seek the best or higher good for your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 28. It's easy to love those who love us back, but loving those who are against us is a whole different ballgame. However, this kind of love reflects the very heart of the gospel. It's not about feelings, but actions. We can choose to do good, to bless and to pray, even for those who aren't kind to us. So, when we think about turning the other cheek, it's about choosing a response that breaks a cycle of retaliation and hate. It's about the strength of forgiveness and the revolutionary love that Jesus exemplified. These teachings challenge us to look beyond our natural reactions and to act in ways that reflect God's love and grace. Isn't it fascinating how these principles, taught over 2,000 years ago, are still so relevant and challenging today? They compel us to think, how different would our world look if we all practiced non-retaliation embraced forgiveness, and truly love our enemies. What do you think? So, how do we in our own lives turn the other cheek? It's a challenge to respond to anger, insult, or injustice, not with retaliation, but with grace and courage. Turning the other cheek is about forgiveness, restraint, and responding with love. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the stillness of this moment, we come before you with open hearts, seeking to understand the unique teaching of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
when he instructed us to turn the other cheek. This concept, so radical and countercultural, challenges us deeply and calls us to a higher standard of love and forgiveness. Lord, in a world that often values retaliation and pride, teach us the humility and strength it takes to turn the other cheek. Help us to see that this is not a call to passivity or weakness, but a bold stand for peace and a testament to the power of your love in our lives. It is a call to reflect your grace, even in the face of injustice and hurt. We confess, Father, that too often our first instinct is to react in anger or to seek revenge when we are offended. Our natural desire is to respond in kind, to hurt as we have been hurt. But you call us to a different path, one of mercy, forgiveness, and self-control. Help us to remember that when we choose to turn the other cheek, we are displaying the same grace you have shown us. Grant us, O God, the courage to practice this challenging teaching in our daily lives, when we are confronted with criticism, misunderstanding, or hostility, empower us to respond not with bitterness or aggression, but with patience and a spirit of forgiveness. Let our actions be guided by love and a deep desire for reconciliation, not by the desire to prove ourselves right. As we endeavor to live out this command, we ask for your wisdom. We understand that turning the other cheek does not mean allowing ourselves to be continuously harmed or abused. Give us discernment to know when to stand firm in our principles and when to walk away in peace. We lift up all those who find themselves in situations where it is especially hard to turn the other cheek. For those facing persecution, discrimination or personal attacks, Provide strength, resilience, and an unshakable peace that comes from you. May their actions serve as a powerful witness to your love and grace. Father, in our relationships with family, friends, colleagues, and even strangers, help us to be ambassadors of your peace. Teach us to handle conflicts with a spirit of gentleness and respect, always ready to forgive and seek forgiveness. May our willingness to turn the other cheek be a light in this world, pointing others to the transformative power of your love. We also pray for those who may have wronged us. You have called us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. In obedience to your word, we lift them up to you now. We ask that you work in their hearts as well as ours to bring healing and reconciliation. Where there is hatred, so love. Where there is injury, pardon. And where there is discord, union. Lord, as we reflect on the example of Jesus, who himself turned the other cheek in the face of unimaginable suffering and injustice, fill us with gratitude. His sacrifice on the cross was the ultimate act of love and forgiveness, a gift that we can never repay. May our lives be a continual thanksgiving for this gift, expressed in how we treat others. Finally, we ask that you continue to mold us into the image of your Son. Each day, as we encounter trials and tribulations, help us to remember his words and to live them out. May our lives be a testament to the power of turning the other cheek, the power of your unending love and grace. In the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen.